Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Vocast. I'm your host, Ethan Drew, and we've got another special guest with us today. We've been on a bit of a sprint with the podcast lately. Today we have on the host of the YouTube channel, Mortius. Say hello, my friend. Hello! So for those that don't know him, he is in the YouTube reaction space of YouTube. So I'm going to have him give a bit of an elevator pitch as to what he's involved in and his uh, music journey, and then we'll dive right into the podcast. So take it away, Mortius. Uh, Yeah, so short version is just... Hello, I am Mortius. Um, I've been doing reactions to primarily acapella music for about two years or so. Uh, Reactions and analysis, and my kind of goal with my content, uh, among other things, is I try to approach things from the sort of structural aspect of acapella. Uh, There's plenty of people out there, amazing, talented people who talk about the vocal quality, the performances, everything like that, but I like really picking apart like the Lego bricks of acapella music and kind of explaining them in a way that's approachable to anyone. So that's kind of what I try to bring to that reaction space that I am blessed to be a part of. Absolutely. And folks, so for those that don't know him from his channel or from my channel, he is a pleasure to be around. We're excited to have him today. Guys, if you are enjoying the content and you want these podcasts to keep coming, make sure you drop a like. Drop a comment down below. Make sure, even if it's just a smiley face, it helps with the algorithm quite a bit. Mortius, I'm sure you can agree with that. 100%. Comments are huge. Comments are huge. Make sure you drop a subscription if you're feeling extra generous. And if you're feeling even more generous than that, my Patreon is linked in the description below where you can support me as little as $1 a month if you choose to be that generous. Not required. With that said, we're going to dive right into today's interview and podcast. And uh, we're going to start really light with this one. Uh, What is your favorite or preferred drink? My drink of choice is kind of a weird one. It's root beer. Um, Liquid candy hearts over there. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, Root beer has been a big thing for me for a long time uh we in the kind of the small town i grew up in we had this kind of old-fashioned candy shop nearby that had like the whole wall of bottled sodas uh, and that was something that my dad and i really got into um when i was younger and that's just kind of stuck with me that's like the one thing that i'm like weirdly snobby about is just like i'm like at a restaurant i was like "Mm, a and w no thank you um like i really i'm really really into like good root beer my pandemic project was trying to brew my own root beer i have (laughs) passionate opinions about what makes good root beer good and bad root beer bad it's i could get into the weeds for that but that's not why we're here (laughs) so root beer so root beer how did you fall in love? So you kind of told us like how you like got into it, but um, what made you like root beer in particular over all the others? So kind of, it started as just kind of the association of it with my dad and my childhood and things like that. Um, not to obviously like get too far into my own uh, stuff, especially for my dad, but just growing up, He pretty much would always just like, that was kind of the thing that we would do is we would sit out on the deck. We had this beautiful property and just kind of the way we bonded is we would chat. And as a kid, it would make me happy because I would have a bottle that looked the same as his. And half the time the bottle he had was actual beer. And as (laughs) I started getting more and more into it, half the time he started getting just as into root beer as I did. So I always had just a bottle of root beer out on our porch and in the sunset my dad 50 percent of the time had a you know coors 50 percent of the time had one of the various root beers we had found and that was just kind of just something we did the on thing. the summers yeah. it became just the thing we did together on summers was a dark bottle of deliciousness out yeah. on the patio together and ever since then i've remained very just passionate about <laughs> root beer <laughs> I think you're the first person on the podcast that has ever mentioned root beer as the favorite drink. I'll take it. It'll be the first of many weird opinions I have on this podcast, I'm sure. 
Oh, <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> I can guarantee you, though, I probably have a stronger ginger ale addiction than most people. I do very much enjoy ginger ale. This is my favorite ginger ale of all time. You'll have to send I, me a link to that. Yeah, um, they have a website. I'll send it to you, but they sell this at my local grocery store called Foodline. And these are right at just a right at a dollar a piece. Maybe Honestly, I'm so sad because when we moved from Vegas to Oregon, um, we lost like ac- like easy access to one of my favorite root beers. It was in just grocery stores down in Vegas, and it's not up here, and it breaks my heart. Ah, oh, that sucks. I think my, my favorite root beer that isn't from, like, a location. Like, my favorite root beer is Snoqualmie Brewery. My second, third, fourth probably all come from different breweries or distilleries that do their own root beer. But as far yeah. as just, like, to get from a bottle on a grocery store shelf, if you happen to live in Vegas or California or anywhere else that offers it, is Bulldog. Bulldog root beer is the best, like, mass-produced, not-in-house root beer on the market, in my opinion. So I'm I'm trying to remember. I think I remember seeing that in the same aisle that I get this ginger ale from. It's good root beer. I recommend it wholeheartedly. I personally have never enjoyed it. To me, I've also never enjoyed Candy Hearts. So mm. it's just not my thing. But I, I, I totally get the... I totally get it because my dad and my uncle are big into good root beer. Mm-hmm. So can relate on to some degree on that secondhand relation i get it yeah oh also i don't i didn't show you this yet but let me see to show you how uh how much i enjoy this ginger ale i have i'm a, ready ma- i have a mason jar full of bottle caps <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i should totally start doing that with root beer and what i'm absolutely do, this, do that what i'm what i'm trying to do with this is um i'm trying to get a sponsorship from boylan I love that. I've been trying for so long. It's been months at this point. I've been sending emails, and I'm trying (laughs) so hard. I am a loyal customer. If there's anybody in my audience that is a Boylan Bottling Co. member or knows anybody that works for Boylan, have them contact me. I'd love to work with you. Mm -hmm. As I'm plugging their drink and uh, doing a podcast at the same time. (laughs) Hey, do what you got to do. Moving along swiftly to a more music-related question. This one's going to be kind of broad and take as much time as you need to answer it. Oh, boy. But um, what or who got you into music? I mean, that's... It's been like the answer to that question would have to come from my mother because it predates my own memory. I have videos I, that I could probably find at some point if I asked that I know I've seen before of me pre any memories that the current version of me can have of me <laughs> singing along to Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> um, so I get like my answer would probably have to be Disney and very specifically would probably be Beauty and the Beast and the live-action Newsies were probably the two things that my mom always tells me that I sang along the most to as a kid. So I guess that would have to be my answer. (laughs) But the real answer I can give is anything and everything with a beat for as long as I can possibly remember. So you kind of really had it with you from the beginning then? From the very beginning. Like I said, I grew up on Beauty and the Beast. That was... My favorite movie probably up until my teenage years, like as a young kid, that like stayed with me from the earliest ages up until, like I said, my teenage years. Yeah. Um, so how yeah. did you find out that you could sing in particular? If you do. So I actually kind of couldn't for a while. Um, I shouldn't say I couldn't because clearly there was some level of ability there that just needed to be honed, but I did not really have the good ability to carry a tune or anything like that, uh, until high school choir. Um, a lot of my buddies who are older than me, um, I just due to 
I don't want to get into too specifics. It could very quickly into like doxing territory because of how small the town I grew up in was. I feel like if I start getting specific, <laughs> it would be very easy to find the people I'm talking about. But right. just due to the nature of the circles I grew up in, I kind of was like the fake, like the adopted little brother to a lot of kind of two, three years older than me guys. Um, yeah. Not like a huge age gap or anything like that, but like when I was going into freshman year, there were a lot of like juniors and seniors who were really into like the choir and drama program. So they kind of tried to adopt me into it and very quickly discovered that all I really needed was some guidance to actually really find my voice. And you found and it. And I went through my own kind of weird journey with that, too. Because freshman year, I was an alto. Like, I literally <laughs> didn't even sing with the boys. Uh, I had a very high voice. But because I was able to kind of build that control into that, into that sort of high prepubescent chest and falsetto, yeah. I was able to really build a lot of that control. And that's why I'm kind of an anomaly where my sort of speaking voice and power range are so much are in like sort of the bottom like 30 percent of my natural range i can't sing much lower than i speak and like i have the range of a tenor but the belt range of a baritone and that usually surprises people when they hear they're like will you sing this like crazy thing and i'm like i can I can hit all those notes, but if you want me to put my entire gut into it, I'm going down to Poor Unfortunate Souls because that's where I live. <laughs> um, so, like, because what it was is as my voice started dropping, my choir teacher wanted me to maintain that higher range control. So I would actually yeah. do vocal exercises to maintain my higher range. So, like, yeah. in a world where I didn't have those sort of vocal exercises and those t specific two teachers, I might have ended up a baritone, but I crafted my voice in a way where I maintained that control, especially yeah. up in my falsetto, yeah. even through the changes of puberty. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. That is interesting. So that's an interesting little uh, elevator pitch on how you got into music, is that obviously you were born with it, but you didn't recognize that you uh, could sing until... A Later on, at least. I mean, I could always match pitch. Like, if I was singing along to something, I could always sing along to it well. But, yeah. like, of course, you know, I was a middle schooler in, like, 2008, 2009-ish. So, yeah. of course, I was like, I could be on American Idol, like every child <laughs> during that time. Yeah. Uh, and what I very quickly learned, and what my parents very quickly learned, is... Before my choir years, my ability to hold a tune was dependent on that tune actively being <laughs> sung by someone else. If I was just going on my own, I was all over the place. But I've always been able to match pitch. I mean, even like I said, those really young ones, when I'm like singing along to Beauty and the Beast and things like that, I could match pitch from a young age. But it yeah. wasn't until all the way up to high school where I learned to actually control it independently and have that sort of awareness of my own. Yeah. And then high school came with both choir and drama, which I'm sure will shock everyone that I was a drama kid. Definitely don't give any of those vibes off. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. So a funny little trend I've noticed with the people that I've had on the podcast is mm -hmm. that like, it's either they've known their entire lives or been in it their entire lives, or it just kind of came out of nowhere later in life for music and singing. Yeah. It's like, it's not, it's like, it's almost like there's no in between. It's kind of funny in a way. Yeah, no. It. All right, let's see. Next question. So, who were some of the most influential figures in your life and your music journey? So, my choir program in high school kind of was going through kind of a tumultuous kind of period with different instructors um and so i actually um had three different choir teachers in four years oh wow um so to an extent all of them because they all brought very different things kind yeah. of to the plate and to the table there yeah. but as far like 
it's kind of hard to identify any one person specifically. Um, like you can just that as many whole... as you want to. No, I know, I know. But just that whole program, like any of those upperclassmen that I met, um, there was one, the uh, girl who was the lead in um, my uh, freshman year musical when I did Guys and Dolls, the girl who was the lead there, I'm still in sort of rare contact with, but still definitely someone I would call a friend. They've definitely been one of my biggest inspirations in life. She's an absolute just doll of a person, like if Glitter was a human being. Um, <laughs> I love her to absolute death. Um, many of just like my peers, both the upperclassmen and same class as me. And then sort of getting into my adult years, um... I was a member of the San Diego Gay Men's Chorus for two years uh, and definitely found a lot of opportunity to kind of hone my art there. Um, but really, like, just... It's hard because I haven't really actually, beyond just high school theater and everything like that, really existed in a lot of musical space. So, like, I've always had support, but, like... yeah. It's almost weird to say, like, it's like, who are the people who are most influential in my music journey aren't really the people who shaped it, but are just the people who encouraged me to shape it myself. There you go. Hey, there like, you go. Everyone who is just, like, along for the ride, and my wife at the time girlfriend who was willing to lose me to multiple rehearsals a night, and... My mom, who drove me to 6 a.m. jazz choir rehearsal and picked me up from 6 p.m. musical rehearsal, like, <laughs> who just knew their kid was out of the house for 12-hour days and was willing to make both of those drives each time. Like, just everyone who looked at the weird kid who didn't know who he was yet and were like, yeah, I'll do what I can to help you find that. That's, that's my answer. And Absolutely. luckily, that's a lot of people in my life who fall into that role. Well, that's awesome. You've had a lot of support, definitely, it sounds like. Definitely. I can totally relate with you on that. I used to be a band kid, so definitely can relate on all the sacrifices there. So, all right, so the next question I have on the list is, what is something that one of those influential figures has said to you that stuck with you your entire life? It can be related to anything, related to music. Man. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of a specific line or anything like that. I... I really... I, I might be at a loss for this one, actually. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Um... We could probably circle back around to this one and see if maybe you, uh, I'll see thought. if I can keep that in the back of my brain while I'm answering other things. But if you, yeah, yeah, definitely give it some thought. I will. Um, um, yeah, I don't think I have an answer to that one. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Let's see. All right. So for those that don't know, do you play any instruments? And if so, what are they? Goodness, no. <laughs> I am uh, self-identified as instrumentally challenged. Um, my <laughs> lovely editor, Mason, makes fun of me for it regularly um, <laughs> because my editor is very instrumentally talented. But, um, yeah, no, there's not really any instruments I've ever found myself particularly good at. Um, I In senior year, I took world drumming. Um, as an elective, um, just, I thought it seemed interesting and, um, you were able to get away with it as a PE credit because of some really weird gray area. <laughs> um, and, uh, also surprise number two, wasn't very athletic growing up. Um, <laughs> shocking. Um, but, uh, so I'm able to hold a beat fairly well on just a single drum. I can't even do like a drum kit or anything like that, but like if I have like a djembe or anything like that, or even like sometimes like I'll add to my own music, like if I'm like just kind of hitting along my own chest, like I kind of learned some things there where I know that doesn't really count as an instrument, but like I did actually learn how like that rhythm works. I'm able to kind of hold a beat there 
to kind of enhance a vocal performance if I really need to, but for the most part, the only instrument I've ever had me promise with is the one I was born with. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Hey, n- nothing wrong with that. The voice is still a really good uh, instrument itself. Uh, let's see, next question. So, what are some things that people may not know about you given your internet life? So, this could be anything, anything musical, personal life, interests I don't know because as far as just like who I am and things like that I am a fairly open book I always say what I mean on the channel and like say what's on my mind you know what I mean like I yeah, yeah. I don't but at the same time like I definitely like Like any odd interests that you may have or any yeah, hobbies that people don't know about? I think a lot of people... Actually, this one I know surprises people. I really enjoy listening to... Uh, and this is probably going to like make a lot of people be like, oh, like this is going to be a little sacrilegious, but specifically for like Mortius and the things that are like really popular on my channel, Yeah, I don't enjoy listening to acapella music for the same purpose as just regular music. Like I don't have acapella playlists. I acapella music has to be a mood and that is a different experience for me. I think (laughs) it is a almost superior experience for me. I think it is some of my favorite music listening to experience, but like every once in a while, like, the algorithm will be like, hey, this guy's YouTube is filled with, um, like, acapella. We should throw some acapella at him, whatever Skynet god algorithm gods are looking at me. But, like, (laughs) if I'm cooking in my kitchen and I throw on my country playlist and Home Free comes on, I'll skip it. Uh, Fair enough, fair enough. Like, that's not what I'm there for, and I'm just absently listening to music. Like, for me... Acapella music is such a different listening experience that I don't just listen to acapella music you on my own it, time. Right? Exactly. I I have to be in it to, you have to really be really diving into it almost exactly. like doing YouTube for it. Yeah. Exactly. And even when I'm listening to it not as Mortius, whether it's a group that I'm not planning to do a reaction to or something I'm just re-listening to, like I'm still listening to it to listen to it. I'm not yeah. listening to it to have music on. And I think that for me, acapella, especially your voice plays home freeze, don't serve that purpose for me. Like they don't serve the purpose of music for me. So I'd say that's probably something that would surprise people is just like outside of Mortius, I don't listen to acapella that much. That is actually quite an interesting um, take there because I actually had no idea that that you actually thought that way. That's interesting for sure. I, I'm I'm not I'm not against it though. I can I can relate honestly. Like I will say that like I love acapella and I sometimes I will listen to it, but I usually listen to other music the majority of the time. Like I usually try to whenever I do a video, I break I break the music down or anything like that for YouTube. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much the only time like I actually listen to it. And I've never really thought about like vocalizing it in the way that you just did because I'm like, wait a minute, like how do I explain that I don't listen to it all the time? Yeah, it's just <laughs> it's like I said, it's very different. Like my wife even my wife has like a Pentatonics and voice play Pandora station and like she'll listen to that in her own time and I'm just like like I don't mind it, but like it doesn't really yeah. do anything for me. Like that's I feel like acapella is not designed to be background music, at least not the way my brain processes it. So I don't really do so. Like people are always like, Oh, I've got like just voice play on around my house while I'm cleaning. And I'm like, why? (laughs) (laughs) It's just a different listening experience. It's very different listening experience. You, it's one of those things where it's, it's like, it's like going to watch a live action play. Mm -hmm. it's like one of those things where you need to be all engrossed in it to really enjoy it. Yeah. hundred percent. And if you're just kind of casually listening to it, it doesn't really pop or have the same sparkle, I guess you could say. Yeah. I am in total agreement with you on that one. 
Let's there we see. go. Two against the world. <laughs> All right. All right, let's see. So the next one. What are some things that you do in your off time when you're not recording videos, singing, etc.? So I work part time as a vision therapist. Um, and that is a job that I am very blessed to give me very long hours, only three days a week, uh, which is kind of the perfect scenario. I kind of make up for them because they end up being 10, 11 hour days if you combine uh, the shift, the commute and the lunch, because uh, I work about 30 minutes away. Yeah. Um, and so like I've got an hour of commute, an hour of lunch, and then the shifts themselves usually wind up being about nine, nine and a half hours. So yeah. that's 11 hour days plus. Um, but I only end up having those three days a week. So, uh, the other two weekdays while my wife is at work, cause she works Monday through Friday. Those are my mortiest recording days. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of the time I fill my time. I do, um, uh, decent amount of stuff around the house. Um, I always try to make sure that our weekends can be filled with a little bit more um, fun and enjoyment. So I try to, you know, try to clear the kitchen um, and things like that. Try to at least get the dishwasher loaded and unloaded. Take care of the dogs who are both sleeping next to me right now. It's very cute. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, they're actually really, really cute right now. Goodness gracious. Uh, sorry. Um, no worries. <laughs> and then beyond that, if I'm not uh, working either of my two jobs, YouTube or vision therapy, um, I like to do video games. I like to uh, work with my hands at a various number of things. Uh, right now, I am actively sewing a shirt um, oh, cool. for uh, an upcoming LARP game that I'm going to be participating in. Um, I watch youtube i hang out with my friends i play dungeons and dragons twice a week um yeah that's pretty much it first person that's mentioned D on the channel sacrilegious <laughs> everyone should mention D D is the best what although kind of actually D? i should clarify because I'm kind of slowly moving away. It's so synonymous, like just saying, like I play D and D is so synonymous with the game. But yeah. especially after not to get into the weeds of any of that nonsense, but the distributors behind D and D have made some very disappointing decisions lately. And so the game that I play in on Saturdays is still D and D, but the game that I run on Saturdays is actually recently moved to Pathfinder, uh, which is a different uh, tabletop RPG, kind of similar to D and D, but with some different kind of vibes to it. And yeah, I might also be starting another game. That's a completely different system. Uh, so I might be playing in three systems kind of all at once. There you go. What kind of video games do you play? Oh, kind of off the rails a little bit here. Pretty much any and all, as long as they are pretty narratively heavy. Um, that's kind of my number one priority in um, gaming, is yeah. the story and things like that. So I'm willing to kind of tolerate, really, uh, tolerate's a harsh word, but I'm willing to go through really any genre um, if there is a good story behind it. I mean, like, three of my favorite games of all time are completely different genres. Yeah. Um, or at least three of my favorite, like, narrative games. You've got, like, God of War, which is, like, open-world RPG. Uh, yeah, the Mass yeah. Effect series is a first-person shooter. Undertale is a top-down 8-bit RPG. Like, I will play any video game if it will make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are my rules. They gotta, got, they gotta get me choked up at some point. I've got one uh, game that I could suggest to you that I've recently started playing that I just can't... It'll make you cry, but in a different way. Hit me. It will hit. It will make you cry laughing. Oh. Um, have you ever heard of the Loathing series of games? No. Um, there's three games. There's Kingdom of Loathing, which is the first one. The second one was West of Loathing. And the third one that came out, I believe, last year, almost two years ago, was uh, Shadows Over Loathing. It's, it's an RPG narrative style uh, comedic game like it's designed to be funny if you don't okay. laugh at any point whenever you're playing one of these three games then you have no soul <laughs> like, I'll have to check it funny. out 
if you are familiar with Markiplier, he's done um, he's done a playthrough of West West of Loathing, and mm, he did a okay. partial playthrough of Shadows Over Loathing. If you want an idea of what the game is like, I might check that out. I used to really like. Uh, yeah, I was totally into that like early YouTube. I loved like Markiplier, Jacksepticeye. I haven't really stayed up to date with them too much, but loved yeah. that like Markiplier, Jack, Game Grumps, Rooster Teeth kind of era of YouTube there. The like the kind of that era, the let's play era, the like right after the OGs. Like I was a little yeah. bit too young for like your Smosh and your things like that. Like the very, very early, but kind of that like yeah. second wave of YouTube was like mm-hmm. For a lot of my childhood. Oh yeah, me too. So Mark, or his West of Loathing playthrough was absolutely comical. If you want a good watch and if you want a taste of what the game is like, it's awesome. I'll have to keep that in mind. All right, next question. We are. Let's see here. More on to music now. Um, how often do you practice singing throughout the week, if at all? And how long do you typically practice for? I was about to say. I'm like, does practice like. It's a very general term. In exactly. This I was like, I think that anytime you're singing, you are practicing. And in yeah. that regard, uh, I would say for most of my 30 minute commutes every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as far as actual, like intentionally, like learning music, honing my craft, not that frequently, honestly, I will do warm ups before I do any kind of actual recording, uh, vocally, whether that's um, any of my own covers that I've been working on or anything like that. But for the most part, like, not actually that much, believe it or not. I got you. I got you. Kind of jam out in the car every once in a while. Exactly. You always gotta. Always. Always, always, always. <sighs> Let's see. Next one we have here. Um... So what does your warm-up routine look like on any given day? Um, so my warm-up is pretty much just, like, it's not any kind of official warm-up. This, I want to make it very clear, this is not vocal advice to anyone who's trying to get better on their craft or anything like that, but... And, and also, just quick, real quick, we are not yeah. medical doctors. Never. Never, ever medical doctors. Um... I really, I just try and um, pick songs that kind of, I know, float to the bottom and top of my range. Um, And like, like I said, just a song that kind of exists low and goes high um, so that I can kind of just warm up my voice in both directions because I... I don't really have a piano, so I can't like do like my bum bum. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I like have a regimen of just a couple songs um, that, like I said, just sit at the bottom of my range and also go up towards the top that I just kind of riff my way through in preparation. And once I feel warmed up, I sing. Like I, I approach music very lackadaisically, and that's not an approach that works for everyone, but like. Right. I've never, this sounds bad, but I've never taken it seriously. Mm. But like, because like, I've never, that's why I'm able to explain things in very layman's terms, sort of lackadaisically is because that's how I experience music. Like I, people hear the way I communicate and the way I talk about things like, and this is this is going to get a little bit like much bigger, broader and almost semi-political and I'll make sure I don't get there. But people, especially in our online world, convey well-spokenness with educate with being educated. Right. Being good at speaking on a topic does not make you knowledgeable on that topic. That is a very true statement. And guys, for those that don't know. This is not, or this is not a political podcast. But <laughs> opinions are freely expressed so long as they are appropriate, and this is absolutely true. This isn't just an opinion. This is fact. Exactly. I won't say anyone specifically in that regard, especially politically, right. but just like it's there is a difference between being knowledgeable on a subject and being really good at talking about it. Um, 
Hank yeah. Green very recently talked about this, in fact, about the fact that Hank Green is like, if for those of you who don't know who he is, um, he was, I'm so blanking on the show he used to do. Oh my gosh. The show was like my childhood. Oh, I'm so annoyed at myself right now. Oh, nope, nope, no, 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 no. We're taking a pause. Hold on. Yeah. Now, now the primary thing he does is, uh, like, he does a lot of stuff on TikTok that's kind of science education. But what was that show he used to do? Hold on. I can't show. Insert uh, elevator music here. And we yeah. will come back whenever he's found it. I have this really cool little uh, cut video that I use. So it works perfect. <clears throat> oh. oh, okay. It was developed by PBS. Okay. Okay. We can bring it back. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, it was, he used to do, that was part of what I was called Crash Course. And it was apparently a YouTube series that was published through PBS. Because I was like, I swear I saw it on TV. So I was confused when I saw it was just a YouTube series. But I guess it was both. Anyways, yeah. he talked recently about how like, He's very knowledgeable about certain things, but people assume he's knowledgeable about other things because he's very well spoken. So, yeah. like, I am not that musically knowledgeable. I'm just very good at talking. I always <laughs> have been. I'm very good at explaining sort of I'm very good at translating what's going on in my head to sort of terms that make sense to people, especially yeah. people who are like me, people who might experience the world a little bit differently. And so I feel like like people often ask me to cover these like crazy artists and things like that. You know, you're Dimash, you're like this, that and the other. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm talking about. And you guys think I do. And like, but here's the thing. That's not a flaw because that's not the point of right. my channel. Right. Like if anyone is like, hey, can you talk about this vocal technique? I'll be like, no, but I can link you to Jennifer Glatzhofer and Peter Barber <laughs> because they know what they're talking about. I know that my strength lies in entertainment and I am very happy to do that. Absolutely. I have always been, I mean, even from a young age, when I was in drama, I'm not even that good of an actor. And people <laughs> see me on stage and they're like, what are you talking about? You're a phenomenal actor. And I'm like, am I? Be or was that character just me, but bigger? <laughs> and they're like, oh, because I have, not to toot my own horn, incredible stage presence. <laughs> I know how to command an audience. I know how to command an entire auditorium. I can get up in front of people and I can make them laugh. I can make them excited. I can do this, that, or the other. Yeah. My first ever role was just kind of me. The next year, they were like, hey, he did really good. Let's cast him as a villain. It was not a good idea. <laughs> I Look at me. I'm, not a, I'm the least intimidating person you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> My face is glowing pink just because of what I choose to be on this platform. <laughs> um, right. And so it's kind of that same way. I kind of took that and turned it into Mortius. Like the yeah. best roles that I've had are just kind of me. And that's yeah. because I'm able to create that entertainment, be something that people really enjoy watching and bring some level of perspective and education to it but that doesn't mean that like i know what i'm talking about there are very <laughs> smart people who are very bad at explaining what they think and there are also people who seem really intelligent but are actually not really and like <laughs> it's it's important to sort of notice that distinction and i'm not shy about saying like i don't know a dang thing about music theory but because I love acapella music, and because I've made acapella music in the past, I understand what goes into it, and I'm able yeah. to kind of explain that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you've got some, some knowledge bouncing around in there. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can relate. Uh, all right, so next question. Um, 
if you know the answer to this one. What are some of your record high and record low natural chest notes, if you know what they are? Chest? I... Um... I want to say... And this might... I feel like I'm going to say this and then people are going to be like, no, because I feel like I might be misremembering this note. Maybe but not. Let's I want to say it was an E5. E5 for chest. So that's and probably chest. mixed. I would think it would be mixed, but it's not And impossible. see, that's part of... It's tough to know exactly where that distinction is going. Like, once you get into that kind of mixed territory... Um, but let me. There is some people I will say that are incredible with their mixed voices, and it's mm -hmm. really hard to tell to figure out where that, um, see, see. where that. I keep the words not coming to mind right now. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think I could if I actually stood up and brought my microphone, I could probably warm up to that. I wouldn't be able to just produce it right now, but I could probably warm up to that. Uh, I think fine. I think E5 then is where that sits. And again, like I said, that's because I literally did those vocal exercises in high school to maintain a prepubescent range, essentially. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, my low notes are um, much poorer. <laughs> I would not know that off the top of my head. Um, your current your your speaking voice lies in the bottom to middle of the third octaves it sounds like so i'm mm. thinking i'm gonna take a wild stab at and say that the lowest you've probably ever reached like maybe even if you're sick is probably like maybe a g2 or somewhere around there maybe that F2. sounds yeah let's see um oh oh uh what was that there was this one uh let me see hold on yeah. Uh, you you keep talking. I can my brain can multitask. There's a TikTok that I know is my lowest recorded note. Okay. Um, no, I was just gonna say that uh, you sound like you're probably like you've probably talked down to like an F two or an E two at some point. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking probably three. We're futzing around, folks. Yeah. Don't mind us. Yeah, well, I can't figure it out right now, but. Oh, yeah, no worries. Might have been a. S no, that seems way too low. C or C three probably. Maybe. I don't well, know. Was recorded anyway, but yeah. <laughs> but that's a pr pretty decently wild or pretty decently open range for a tenor. Yeah, it's not terrible. Uh, <laughs> and like I said, let's like whatever. Like if I'm not warming up to it. Um, whatever that low note, because one of the ones that I say that, like, I sing a song that's, like, low and high, um, those of you who are familiar with the channel know that my favorite movie is Treasure Planet. Um, yes, me and too. S Love Treasure Planet. Love Treasure Planet. My it's so Disney good! Movie. So good! Disney it's movie. literally, I literally have a Treasure Planet tattoo plastered <laughs> across my entire chest. I will DM it to you. <laughs> um, but and you know what? It's so funny. We're going to take a quick circle back. I still haven't figured out the answer from a real person. Um, yeah. but when you said you were like, what's the most influential quote in you growing up? And I'm like, thank you for asking. That would be, uh, you're going to rattle the stars, um, would be yeah. the most influential quote on me growing up. <laughs> I like that. You're um, going we'll to circle back. The stars. We'll circle back around to that. Um, but what was I doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So from I'm Still Here, that's one of my go-tos that goes low and high. So typically my lowest note without warming up to it is that, like, you can't take me and throw me away. Like, whatever that... That's way. an A, too. All right. Be so flat. that's that's kind of right around where I bought it without warming up. Okay. Uh, if, or I guess warming down. <laughs> uh, if I... <laughs> 
if I do vocal warmups and try, I can push it below that. But just like for my natural, like where I bottom out, that's kind of like that lowest note. Uh, as yeah. well as if it's lower, uh, the other one that I do uh, for my vocal warmups that really goes low and high is this is gospel. Because obviously that chorus is, let me go, go, and chest. But that yeah. uh, initial chorus, like, passing their hypotheses. Led away by imperfect imposters. I don't know if that's the same note or if that's lower, but pretty close. Yeah. So, um, though that's kind of where the bottom of my range sits if I'm not like actively working on it. It's kind of those two songs. So, for those that don't know, Mordius is only the second tenor that's ever been interviewed on the podcast. I've mostly done bass singers and uh, ladies. So, this is the second. Who was the first? The first one was Casper Fox. Ah, yeah, that man doesn't count. He's not, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, we don't get to call him a tenor anymore. He's lost that title. He is a, <laughs> he is a demon. A <laughs> demon walking among men. No, he doesn't get to he doesn't get to call that anymore. No, just because he can hit tenor notes, Jeff Castellucci can hit tenor notes. Doesn't make him a tenor. Ten, no, Casper's banned. Casper doesn't get to claim that title anymore. When Casper. he made his, whatever deal with the devil he made for the capabilities that he has, he lost uh, the right to be included in the natural tenor club. I've seen he is some now of your, something else. <laughs> I've seen your reactions to some of his music and it's just hilarious. Inhuman. Hilarious. <laughs> I mean, he's able to do second subharmonics so easily and make it right to completely effortless. Yeah. You're like, Oh wow. What? Like, wow. We've had two tenors on the channel. No, you've had one alien and now you've had one tenor. <laughs> Casper's <laughs> not allowed in the club anymore. <laughs> Casper, if you're watching, we love you, buddy. <laughs> love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, so. Someone please remember to DM me the timestamp of this part so I can send it to Casper. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're looking at about 46 minutes in. Perfect, perfect. I'll remember that. 46 minutes. All right, so next question. Um, so can you share with us briefly... Um, no, I can't do anything briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you? You've heard me for the last forty-five minutes. If you can, you answer this question briefly. No, no, I can't. Next question. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> Will you share with us some a few of your favorite moments in singing with other people? So this could be back in high school, in even recently. If you have any, even. Or you can just go with any of your favorite moments and just music in general. Like whenever you're singing. Um, the high school I went to had an unofficial sort of men's chorus uh, that did this really cool song that I cannot remember the name of, but I'm going to sing a little bit of it right now. And if anyone can name it in the comments, I don't even know what I'll give you, but it'll, I don't know, <laughs> a shout out for sure. But yeah. um, there was this one song they did, so it was only open to uh, sophomores and above. Um, but it was like, Viva la, viva la, viva la more, viva la, viva la, viva la more, viva la more, viva la more, viva la company. And that's how it starts with everyone just on that. But yeah. then it goes to like, viva la, viva la, viva la, viva la, viva la, viva la. Like it's one that's like a sort of cascading, oh, rolling one. Yeah. So it's yeah. one that kind of builds on itself. It gets very complex. And so that was a fan favorite. I got to my sophomore year, I got to be part of it, and we were going to a festival. And that festival had specifically requested a reprise of that song because of how popular it was the year before. Yeah. And I was really sad that I couldn't be involved in it because I hadn't learned it the year prior. And so one of the upperclassmen who I was really close to uh, came over to that just like little like crappy ass like hotel room that we had all gotten where it was like three of us per hotel room and three very stressed out high school employees and volunteers yeah. um, and like a festival high school across Eastern Wa or festival <laughs> hotel across Eastern Washington. Um, but he came over and he like spent a good, like three hours, like 
after the first day of festivals teaching me that part so I could sing that with them the next day, even though I hadn't learned it the year prior. So I got yeah. to be part of this like really cool encore for one of my favorite songs that really I shouldn't have been included in. So that was really cool. Um, this one, so that one's kind of answering like the singing with someone else. This one, like I was singing it with a choir, but I like really the memory is my own. So maybe this is kind of a selfish answer to this question. But another yeah, one of my favorite singing experiences is um, uh, getting to do the um, the uh tenor soloist part of Baba Yetu my senior year. Um are you familiar with that song? Uh I feel like I've heard the name, but I if I if I heard it I could probably figure it out. I'll have to listen it's, to that off camera. Uh Christopher Yin um it's a really really good song. Uh it translates to the Lord's prayer in Swahili. Um, and even though I've gone on my own journey since then that I won't discuss, um, when I discovered the song in the first place, I was still very much into that religion that I had grew up in. Um, and even though my religious journey has kind of changed since then, that song still holds a very important place in my heart. Uh, yeah. but it's also just an absolutely gorgeous song with a wild solo. Um... <laughs> And what was great is it was me and one other kid in uh, running for it. And I actually think if, like, it was just as far as vocals, I think he technically kind of earned it more. But I had been listening to that song for years. And so he came in and he hit every note perfectly. But it was very clear that he was kind of just like doing his besting his way through the Swahili language. I was hitting, like, the vocal flips. I was, like, like I was, res like, hitting the Swahili words respectfully at, yeah. like, my little white high school with 500 kids in it. <laughs> and I think that's why I got the uh, part. And I think that was one of my coolest experiences, was just having that whole choir behind me and getting to just belt out this incredible Swahili tenor line with my entire choir backed up behind me. It was really cool. That sounds pretty awesome. Not gonna lie. And like I said, it's just a wild solo. It's uh, got just such force behind Like it almost feels like I don't want to like try and it's always tough because like I don't want to compare my own experiences to like again not to get overly political but like don't want to compare my own experiences obviously to those who have a culture who I will never be a part of and wouldn't understand but just like the delivery of it like it feels very just like the power behind it this I hope is not an insensitive comparison but just like the same like sort of like vocal power behind it like you know like the Black Panther soundtrack or any mm -hmm. other like music from that region, how it just has so much power behind it. That like that diaphragm control, the whoops, the like, who mm -hmm. the like the everything behind it. Bobby Yetu kind of holds so much of that. And it was so yeah. powerful to kind of get to just perform that. Uh, and we had an actual African drummer on stage with too. Like it was just, it was a very cool experience. Um, and in a, you know, more multicultural high school, maybe I wouldn't have gotten that experience and maybe that would have been okay, but for the high school I had, I think it was a really cool experience. Absolutely. For everyone. Absolutely. That's pretty awesome. I have to yeah. give this a listen in my off time for sure. It's a good one. All right, let's see. I got one more for you, then we're going to do a quick transition piece to a different section of the podcast. Ooh, let's do it. All right, so do you have any tips, tricks, or life hacks for anyone that sings, wants to sing, or is trying to make a career out of singing? I talked about this a little bit in my video with Bobby. Um, my one biggest piece of advice, well, I have two. One is actually vocal, one of the few vocal advices that I would actually feel qualified to give, and then one is just more of a general life advice. Um, the vocal advice is... Don't make the mistake of only focusing on your niche. Uh, Thank you. 
Bobby and I talked about this in our video together um, because we both were victims of the same mistake in opposite directions. He actually regrets not working on his tenor range more. Um, he and I were talking a lot about his sort of higher notes in Iris, which is the cover we were doing together in that yes. interview. Um, and he had that conversation about how he wished that he had given more emphasis to his higher range when he was learning instead of only focusing on that low. And I made the opposite mistake. Uh, I, as I've mentioned multiple times so far, was so focused on holding on to those beautiful, crisp falsettos that allow me to sing Defying Gravity in the original key that yeah. I forgot to actually care about the lower range I was developing into. Right. Um, and I really regret that. I wish I could sing lower notes. I wish I didn't struggle to spit out the lower notes of my favorite songs right, um yeah. so vocally my advice is like yeah vocally my advice is find um or is work on the parts of your voice and your craft that are not just your niche or your strength some untapped potential there folks mm-hmm could be you never know exactly as far as more general life advice for people wanting to get into things is just this is going to sound i'm going to start pessimistic and then bring it back around to optimistic all right let's go for it you're not going to achieve exactly the dream you want and if that is the only part of it you will be satisfied with, that will make you sad. Absolutely. But that, like, it can't be all or nothing. It can never be all or nothing. Right. Find, like, shoot for, like, that whole, like, shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. It's so mm -hmm. cliche, but it's also so true. And it is true to my own experience. Like my biggest piece of advice is just find a way to incorporate what you love into your life. Powerful there. Don't feel the need to make it your life because very few people are lucky enough to do so. If you love music, sure, try to become a professional singer. But in the 99% reality that that doesn't happen, start a YouTube channel. Join Absolutely. your local acapella group. Sing to the car. Become a teacher. Teach other people to sing. Become, like, learn your craft and become a vocal coach. Fight, yeah. Like, there are so many ways. And, like, I'm not going to dox them, but I have a friend, bless her heart, who I try so hard to make understand this. Like... They want so badly to, like, be on Broadway and be this, that, and the other. And I see them, and I'm like, they literally teach kids how to sing, and they work in this place, and they get to work around acting, and they get to work in an environment that brings music and theater and joy to people's lives. And every time I talk to them, they treat it like it's just a transitional phase to what they actually think they want, which is like that big Broadway thing. And I'm like, I hope you get that, but you can't just view that as a stepping stone when really that's, that could be your calling. It could like be, exactly. where, where I am right now I am happy in, and it's not where I thought I would be. I moved down to San Diego to pursue an audition, and I never got that role. I auditioned for the same role seven times in five years. Yeah. Didn't get it once. But I found my stage. It's right here. It's this camera. It's here on this YouTube channel. It's here on this YouTube channel. So you never know where you're going to land, folks. Exactly. Like, finding a way to... And, like, even if you find, like, someone who's good with working with their hands, for example. Like, I know someone who grew up 
And this is kind of grew up the same year as this other friend, but they actually learned the lesson I wish she would learn again. Not right. to call anyone out specifically, but I have another friend who grew up and was like, I want to be an actor. I just love the theater. I love Broadway. I love this, that, and the other, blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah. They grew up in small town Washington with me, uh, very like logger company. They were very good at working with their hands. Throughout high school, they would be really good at helping with the sets. Now, they work in one of the biggest theaters in Seattle. Yeah. In set design. Is that not pretty cool? That's so cool. And if they had in their mind said, no, I'm only going to be happy on this stage as an actor, they wouldn't have landed this incredible role in the environment where they feel like they belong. Don't be too, too narrow-minded, folks. Don't be too narrow-minded. Again, it's such a cliche line. But when you really look at my life and the life of people around me, like that cliche of shoot for the moon, if you miss, you'll land among the stars. It happened to me. Yeah. I have a very happy life right now. I'm in the stars every day. And I'm rattling them. <laughs> bringing it back to Treasure Planet. I'm always going to bring it back to Treasure Planet. There but we go. I'm among the stars. I rattle the stars every day. And I didn't reach the moon I thought I was going to reach. But that's okay. You're, at, you're right where you need to be. My adorable, lovely puppy is asking to be taken out. So why don't we let her have a quick cameo on screen to boost your numbers. Uh, make yeah. sure you include her in the thumbnail. Um, yep. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and then uh, if we can take a quick pause real quick and I'm going to take her out. Yep, we sure will, folks. We will catch you back here in just a second. Mm. All right, folks, we have returned from our quick little intermission. And this is actually good timing because we are now in our transition piece. So, Mortis, what we do here at this point in the podcast is that we give you an opportunity to plug any merch you have, advertise a little bit, self-promote, let us know what you got going on in your uh, career, in your life, anything you want to share. You have the floor for the next few minutes to self-promote or share as you wish. Um, I mean, pretty much uh, for the most part, I've just got my YouTube channel and the things that are sort of branching off from it. So if you like acapella music and things like that, definitely please consider checking out the channel. Um, I Like I've mentioned a few times here, I like to break down acapella music in a way that's kind of approachable to everyone. Uh, so if you want to learn a little bit more about how acapella is structured, but don't want to get too far into the music theory of it, I like to think that I'm a really great home for that. Uh, I do have a merch line that I think is really, really cute. It, let me grab it. It features the face of my lovely puppy on it with my headphones. Um, and it is actually done through a local merch company. None of those like big name creator merches or anything like that. It's a local print shop. Uh, yeah. so if you do get my merch, not only are you supporting me, but you are also supporting a local small business. Um, and then also be on the lookout, uh, because I have, um, let's do, oh, <laughs> Around Christmas time, uh, I'm hopefully going to be updating that merch uh, with the new puppy as well. Um, as far as other things, I mean, I've got my Patreon if you find your way to the channel and want to support. But of course, no one's going to go straight from an interview to a or to a Patreon. <laughs> so please check out my YouTube channel and decide from there if you want to support over on Patreon. For the most part, like I'm just... I don't really have too much to self-promote except for just the fact that I really love what I do. And I hope that if you are here and are already familiar with me, you give myself the chance to prove it over on my own channel. Guys, make sure you check out his content. He's a very good content creator. He's on the up and up and continuing to rise in popularity, <laughs> rightfully so. He's a good entertainer, knowledgeable in music. And I will have all of his information down in the description below. Patreon, social media, YouTube, etc. I'll have it all down there for you. Great. Thank you. And for the next piece, this also leaves the floor to you for you to ask me any questions, should you mm. have any. Gasp. So you have uh, the floor for the next few minutes if you choose to ask me anything. 
everyone who knows my content is going to be like, oh my gosh, of course he's asking about this. But I just have to because it's so rare for me to meet someone else. So like, have you always loved Treasure Planet? Is that like a new discovery? Is so, that like something since childhood like me? Like I got to know because I so rarely meet people who react the same way as me to this movie. It was such a good movie. I remember watching such a it. Good movie. The, I remember watching it the first time when I was a kid. And I remember being infatuated. I, I couldn't stop watching it growing up. I was just like, can we watch Treasure Planet? Can we watch Treasure Planet? Mom's like, no, you just watched that yesterday. Yeah, yes. it's my favorite <laughs> movie for sure. And also the only movie that I think has been my favorite movie twice. <laughs> like, because, you know, when you're a kid, your favorite movie changes, you know? But so, yeah. like, I think I had, like, Beauty and the Beast for a while then Treasure Planet, and then when Guardians of the Galaxy 1 came out, that sort of took that spot for a little bit. And then yeah. once I moved out, sort of for, started, like, for my own life, Treasure Planet somehow just, like, creeped its way back up. Like, the nostalgia factor got just strong enough that it came back, and I was like, ah, well, I guess this is my personality for the rest of my life. And then it was, because I got a tattoo of it. <laughs> well, there you go. Treasure um, Planet's always been a good movie. It's so underrated. It's so good. Agreed. It's a phenomenal movie. Um, so, yeah. I I don't really even know what else I would ask. I do know one thing. People are always kind of curious about where I came from because I kind of popped up out of nowhere and started yeah, having Yeah, true. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll give you like a brief synopsis hey, of kind of where I came what? from and like what how how i got into it i guess so i in essence i've always wanted to do something with music but i knew that i wasn't going to end up on broadway in five years if i like i wanted to so i figured i'm already i'm already a seasoned people person i'm mm -hmm. i'm a i'm like a think of crippling ec, ec, or introvert but i'm a crippling extrovert oh yeah same 100 percent so I love talking to people all the time. I love music. I love spreading the love for music. I want to spread the love for music like a dang gone if infection. So I'm like, well, how can I do that? And how can I make friends in the music industry? How can mm -hmm. I get into the music industry, get my foot in the door? Not only that, but just find my niche in the music industry and on, in the YouTube space. And it, it clicked. I was like, there's been a recent surge in podcasts. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why don't I do a podcast where I just interview singers and help people better understand the artists that they listen to? Yeah. And just help them gain a, a better appreciation of the music that they listen to Absolutely. through these podcasts, occasional reaction and breakdown videos, and even through my own music at times. But that's just kind of where I came from. And then it light bulb clicked and... I thought it was going to be another ADHD fling because <laughs> I was diagnosed with, well, I wasn't officially diagnosed, but it was pretty clear that I was a victim of ADHD. I empathize. And, um, so, I mean, hey, people with ADHD tend to do a lot of, make a lot of compulsive decisions mm -hmm. or impulsive, I should say. And we do, I thought, <laughs> but I can, I can say that this one at first felt like one. But it it blossomed like pe it took way off more than I anticipated. I was like, people actually really like this stuff. I'm like, and I'm not getting tired of it. Like this is where I'm supposed to be. It's kind of how I felt about my reactions too. Yeah, because I started like right around pandemic time, um, yeah. and so I also didn't know if I would stick with it, but I did. Yeah, well, I didn't realize that people would like this stuff as much as they do. Mm -hmm. But here I am. I'm I'm making money on it. I I which means I can afford to spend more time doing it. I can like it's it's a it's a mini jo second job for me and I I I I couldn't be more thankful. Could not be more thankful. I, yeah. my my rise out of out of the dirt for lack of better um thoughts or ways to describe it kind of mm -hmm. i just kind of up and appeared in november of 2022 so we're approaching 
it won't be long before we we hit a one year mark for the channel being what it is. Which is impressive. Yes, I agree. Three thousand subscribers in a year. Yeah. I love it. I'm so blessed. Thank every single one of you. Y'all are the ones that make this happen. Thank you for supporting us. Thank Absolutely. you for supporting small creators. It, it very much it changes our lives, truly. 100%. It helps, it helps us do what we love to do. Definitely has changed mine. 100%. 100%. Any more that you uh, want to ask me? Um... I guess just I I other than like the couple of uh, reactions and uh, parts of the podcast I tried to check out, like you chose Ethan Drew music. So just like, what are you a singer? Are you an instrument guy? Like from the podcast perspective, I feel like both what you just said and what I had already checked out on your channel, I kind of have a good idea there. But from like, like what music does Ethan Drew music bring? So uh, I I have hey, a particular. Don't eat my finger. <laughs> I have a particular fascination with acapella music. And, As you should. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, but I plan to do more personal music in the future. I'm currently working on an acapella cover. I don't have an estimated date for when it's coming out yet, so guys, stay tuned, by the way. Um, it may be from a may or may not be from a famous movie that has recently come out within the last five years that involves... Um, DC characters. Um, but yeah, I, I have a particular fascination with acapella music. I played, I played trombone for several years. I pick around Ooh. on the guitar, I pl pick around on piano a little bit, but the music that will be coming around on this channel is going to be primarily acapella. Like at cool. least that, co that comes from me. <clears throat> now, Sick. Yeah. Hope that works out for you. Thank you. Um, but I will say the reason I, I did initially start with the channel being named the vocast and more, but I ended up deciding to trans or just move over to a different kind of, I kind of rebrand a little bit because I'm already doing two different things, reactions and interviewing singers. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, at some point I want to do occasional, very occasional music of my own because of I'm, cause I'm probably going to be busy doing podcasts and other music related work. But I'm like, well, what if I want to share some of my own music with some, some of my audience as well? And I'm like, well, I don't want to confuse them. So why don't I just put something that's a little bit more broad but still have this series on the channel called The Vocast and More? And it, it made so much more sense to me in that regard to name myself Ethan Drew Music. That way I'm covering several different music-related topics and covering music in general – interviewing singers and doing my own music. So yeah. I mean, just doing it all at once. It just made more sense to kind of consolidate and just make it, make the name fit better. I guess you could say. No, that definitely makes sense. Cool. But well, yeah. I hope to see your cover soon then. Absolutely. I have actually, technically I do have one out already that I did a collaboration with. I'm not sure if you oh. know who uh, Fernie is. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did a short cover with him. Oh, on, cool. Um, uh, Believer for Imagine Dragons. Oh, fun! I'll have to go find that. Yeah, I'll send it to you after we jump off here in a few. Yeah, I've done a few short covers of my own, but I've only done one that's longer than like the minute thing. Yeah. <laughs> and that was forever ago and very fun, but not that good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you don't have any more questions for me, we're going to migrate into two more questions that we have for the rest of the podcast, and then we'll All wrap right. this thing up. I'm ready for them. All right, so what are your thoughts on extended techniques in singing? What do you mean? So what do you think of extended techniques as a general rule of thumb? So maybe subharmonics, vocal fry, gotcha, um, whistle tones, head voice, stuff like that. I think anything that you can do to create music is valid. I'm in the I same think, boat. I don't think there's anything that, like, is necessarily inherently better or worse about them. Like, I definitely don't like... Obviously... I love when someone has a good subharmonic that rattles my brain in a reaction, but for the most part, like, 
I'm not going to be like, oh, like, this person can whistle no. That makes them inherently, like, really, really impressive. Like, it's... Mm -hmm. The voice is an instrument, and people are starting to learn how to play it in different ways. And what you create with it is far more important than what you are able to do with it. Yeah. So, totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. So are you able to use any of these um, extended techniques? Obviously, you can do head voice. Yes, I have uh, very good control of my falsetto range. Um, and then I can't really use it for, um, like, singing yet. And I don't know if I ever would be able to. But when I was working on my build-up cover, some of the uh, beatboxers in my Twitch chat... Um, taught me how to do throat bass. Uh, so mm-hmm. I did actually learn how to do that technique, that kind of just like... Mm-hmm. And I, exactly. I can't do it on command like that, but if I kind of do it a couple of times. But yes, that kind of thing. But I was able to reach the point where I could use that to go lower than my normal voice could go. Yeah. Um, and so that helped me with that uh, little build-up cover I did that featured Jennifer Glatzelfer. Um, which was super fun, but that's pretty much other than like a good control of my falsetto and a little bit of like throat bass I can do if I need to pull out a trick. Um, I, it's, I would never use it, um, or at least I don't think I would ever use it in like an actual cover because it just doesn't sound good. But if I'm demonstrating notes, I have recently gotten just the ability to just do inhale. Like I can just kind of like... Like I can go a lot lower than I normally could. But it's super shaky. It doesn't actually sound good. But at least if I'm just trying to imitate a note, um, I'm able to do so. My favorite, I have to level with you. My favorite um, extended technique is inhale bass. Oh, really? Um, that is also my preferred. Oh. I've been working on my subharmonics and I like doing subharmonics, but they are not as reliable as my, my inhale bass or my growls because I, my growls have gotten way better lately. Hmm. <laughs> oh. That's impressive. So, yeah. So I've, I'm, I'm much, I feel much better about my growls. Um, I can say that inhale bass is probably my favorite and by far my most reliable. So if I want to go for a stupid low note, like, I, it's, yeah. just, it's just, it's, it's you it, just got to do that. Inhale. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd say that's probably my f- personal favorite out of all of the, uh, out of all of the extended techniques. Yeah. I think I've only used, uh, inhale once not just for note demonstration yeah but yeah i got uh just one more for you then we'll wrap this up hit me with Um, it i'm ready and this is a (coughs) open-ended one too but well sort of kind of if you could steal a fellow singer's voice or just any person's singing voice in general who would it be and why do they have to be living Freddie Mercury, I don't have to explain why. No further questions, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't. I can, I can elaborate if I, if a little bit, but um, easily, that's my easy choice. Um, though Queen is my favorite, like, overall artist. Um, don't Stop Me Now is probably is easily top three favorite songs depending on my mood can often be my favorite song uh depending on when you catch me and ask me definitely one of the most talented voices of our generation of any generation like just yeah uh if they have to be alive i have to think about it more but if we can take anyone from history of music freddie mercury easily no questions asked 100 percent well, he's one of the best rock tenors in general, too. Mm-hmm. 100%. Guys, this has been the Vocast with Mortius. Thank you for joining us today. Very much appreciate your presence. Guys, again, if you if you enjoy his content, you enjoy what he puts out on YouTube, make sure you go check him out. I'll have all of his information in the description below. He puts out very, very good content. He's a good entertainer. And Folks, make sure you, you like this video, too. It's free. 
<laughs> it is free. Come to you free of charge. So make sure you drop a drop a thumbs up, drop comments. Subscriptions help also. Folks, one more quick little thing about subscriptions. The majority of the people that watch my channel are surprisingly not subscribed. So if you are enjoying the content, it supports the channel a lot if you just drop a subscription. And if you want to know when I upload, make sure you hit that bell so that way you're notified whenever I am uploading. One more little uh, self-plug, and we will wrap this up. Folks, again, if you are enjoying the content, I would encourage you to check out the Patreon. That's the best way to support me if you're looking to support me. With that said, we are going to wrap up this episode of The Vocast. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been The Vocast with Ethan Drew and Mortius. We love you. Take care of yourselves, and we will see you in the next one. Bye.